Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to another Fireside Chat brought to you by the 150th Anniversary Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. I'm Judy Hart. Um, in his Founders Day sermon from August 31st, 2003, Reverend Fritz Hudson refers to a quote from his colleague, Leslie Westbrook. Here's the quote. Part of any meaningful relationship with another person is having a sense of shared history. We must remember the past before we can project the future. We must be able to share memories with other people before we can participate in another uniquely human and sacred ability, that of making promises to one another. So that quote actually helps frame my presentation here. So let me get started. Start from here. So over the years, church staff and members have documented our church's transitions, hard times, and celebrations into books, sermons, videos, and timelines. And most of the information I'm going to share with you today come from these sources. Uh, there are very few things that a congregation does that affect it as greatly as a choice of a minister. Ministers are spiritual leaders of our faith communities. They help us explore life's questions, they challenge us to live out our values, and they comfort us in times of suffering. Ministers teach, preach, listen, and learn by leading congregations and working for and work for justice in the larger community. Uh, now my focus uh, in today's uh, chat is on the church's ministers from the beginning in 1870 um, until the ministry of Isaiah Domus in 1953. Each of the ministers deserves his own fireside chat, but alas, today I um, there just isn't enough time to cover all the details that framed all the decisions um, of our faith community. And this presentation is meant only to be an overview. And I really invite each of you to find some of those uh, documents about the history and um, and look for more details about these about any of these men that interest you. Um, this is all. This is from Fritz Hudson's September first, two thousand and two Founders Day sermon. Our founders were riding a boom when they formed our church in eighteen seventy, settled their first min minister James Gorton in eighteen seventy one, and completed the first frame building at 19th and H streets in 1872, but hard times uh, came very soon. There was a national financial panic in 1873 that caused the Universalist Convention to withdraw the subsidy uh, which uh, they were giving us to pay the minister's salary. So Gordon was gone after only two years here. E.H. Chapin came to uh, Lincoln and became the society's second minister. Um, I invite you all to listen to the wonderful um, fireside chat that Fritz Hudson did about the Chapin family. And that can be found on our church's website on the homepage. Uh, follow the link in the about section. Um, the church reorganized after Reverend Chapin's resignation um, to call itself All Souls Unitarian Church. At that point, 96 individuals signed as charter members, and they called the Reverend J. Lewis McDonald to be their minister. On January 20th, 1899, the Reverend Marsh was installed as the first minister of the All Souls Unitarian Church of Lincoln. He was said to be a man of fine address and character, and his sermons were scholarly and deeply spiritual. He also has a really nice beard. Uh, there was considerable growth in membership during Mr. Mar Marsh's leadership. 185 persons joined the 97 charter members. Although Mr. Marsh and his wife were well liked, the church was facing again financial difficulties. Um, at a parish meeting on January 13th in 1908, Mr. Marsh tendered his resignation, which was accepted. According to the minutes of that meeting, it was suggested that uh, committee member C.S. Allen 
was to be in New York soon, and he was requested to proceed to Boston to consult with officers regarding the filling of Mr. Marsh's place. Following that consultation, the Reverend Arthur Weatherly, Weatherly was given a call to um, the ministry here in April 6th of 1908. Um, you can listen to Frank Edler's in in-depth discussion of Arthur and, Arthur and Clara's Weatherly's time here in Lincoln. That also can be found on the website. Now here's a little anecdote from Fritz's Founder Day sermon um, on September 2nd, 2001. Parson Weatherly, as he liked to be called, arrived in a whirlwind from Worcester, Mass, just two months following Marsh's departure. What strikes, and this is Fritz speaking, what strikes me most about our record of Mr. Weatherly's ministry is that I can find there absolutely no reference to his pulpit work. He loved books, that's clear. Our church library core is his library, a solid collection from the period. And he was loved for many traits, even his acknowledged cantankerousness. Uh, what, what comes through most loudly and clearly from the record, however, is the impatience of his outward energy and the incredible list of its results. As Homer Kyle, our next generation's historian, who lived as a student in the Weatherly's pars Parsonage wrote, Arthur wanted this to be a better world and he wanted it to be better now. World War I began and the heightened emotions that arose in our congregation because of uh, Mr. Weatherly's pacifism led to his leaving in 1919. According to Homer Pyle, at the close of the war, some of the more timorous of his friends in the congregation suggested that he would be more useful in some other pulpit. I lost my place. Um, I'm gonna go back to that just because it's important. Um, so what Homer Pyle said was, um, at the close of the war, some of the more timorous of his friends in the congregation suggested that he would be more useful in some other pulpit until the hates and passions engendered by the war had subside, subsided. He accordingly resigned in 1920 to accept a call from the Unitarian Church of Dayton, Ohio. The war years had left the Lincoln Church in a somewhat disturbed state. Our next minister, uh, Mr. Mc, uh, Reverend James McDonald wrote in a report to the Iowa Unitarian Association. I remember that upon my coming, I was told by the trustees and many other members of the church that I was accepting a fighting chance to keep the church in existence. I'm conceited enough to a say that I see no reason to be ashamed of my ministry here. In fact, I'm rather proud of what the church has done in the last four years and of the church's present condition. The end of that quote. Among the accomplishments of um, McDonald's ministry was the acquisition of uh, the tracker organ, uh, building the parsonage on Lake Street and renovating the interior and the church basement. In the first year of his ministry, the first Christmas candlelight service was presented by the children of the church. In 1925, Mr. McDonald was called to the Unitarian Church of Dayton, Ohio. The Reverend Edwin C. Palmer succeeded Reverend McDonald as pastor of the church. Mr. Palmer came to the Unitarian ministry from an Orthodox religious background. His pulpit work is recorded as scholarly and deeply spiritual. The records also note that in his zeal to establish his liberal credentials, he sometimes took rather extreme measures from that day and age. At one point, he tore pages from his Bible while standing in the pulpit. Under his leadership, considerable work was done by the young people of the church to establish friendly relationships with a number of students from the Far East, particularly particularly Filipinos who attended the University of Nebraska. The International Club, composed of students of all races, came to look upon the, Uni the Unitarian Church as their spiritual home. 
Uh, Palmer also took an active interest in the work of organized labor. Although he was very popular with students, the membership of the church itself was declining and the average uh, attendance was about 35. Ish. Uh, Mr. Palmer left in 1928. Um, the Weatherleys had maintained contact with the Lincoln Church during the time they were serving in other churches and they expressed a desire to re return to Lincoln According to church records, some members who had not known him in his first ministry were somewhat apprehensive about bringing a white-haired 60-year-old man to revitalize the church, but they soon found that their fears were groundless. While he might have lost some of the crusading spirit of his earlier days, he still had a vigorous appearance and a zestful determination to bring the church back into the mainstream of the community's progress, and he did. Uh, during his second ministry, uh, Dr. Weatherly not only continues his active participation in the social service affairs of the city and state, but also worked hard to revitalize the church. Membership rose, the church school flourished, the young people's group was very active, and the church entertained the 60th annual conference of the Iowa Unitarian Association in 1937. And in 1938, the church celebrated celebrated its 40th anniversary. It's interesting to note that Dr. Weatherly was minister of the church on its 10th, 20th, and 40th anniversaries. Even though he had passed age 70, Dr. Weatherly was reluctant to retire. His investments during the depression had not turned out well, and the denomination offered only minimal, minimal assistance. Funds were solicited, from interested church members and from outside, from others outside the church, and a retirement fund was set up. In April of 1942, a program of gratitude took place for the Weatherleys. They lived in Lincoln for a short time longer and then retired to their summer home in New Hampshire. The Reverend Carl Storm began ministry in September and won the hearts of the membership by his earnestness and enthusiasm. In 1943, he preached that there can be a unity in our diversity if we will but remember that the pulpit is a place for interpretation rather than a sounding board for any particular kind of propaganda. That not only will the minister be wrong on many occasions, but the person in the pews may be wrong on some occasions. As we agree today, we may both change our views. Hmm. On the eve of VE Day, Reverend Storm cautioned in another sermon, if war has its costs, peace is no lesser degree demands its price. Wendell, Wendell Wilkie, well known for his phrase, one world, also said, Sovereign, sovereignty is something to be used, not hoarded an application on a national and international scale of what Jesus had in mind when he said, whosoever shall lose his life shall find it. The storms were active in all phases of church work, the Layman's League, the Women's Alliance, the Junior Church, and the Young People's Group. In 1947, Mr. Storm was invited to become a minister of the First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis, and that's the church that his wife grew up in. So it was an offer he couldn't afford to decline. So the family left Lincoln in the summer of 1947. There were several months that the church was without a minister uh, following the departure of the storms. Victor Seymour was asked to act as church administrator. The pulpit was filled with church members with an occasional outside speaker. In December, Reverend Philip Shug arrived from the Unitarian Church in Urbana, Illinois to begin his ministry. Mr. Shug was a, was, he was a humanist and had been very active in the struggle to maintain the separation of church and state. He was a good administrator and he took an active interest in the church school, especially the square dance club. I kind of like that. I think maybe when we get back together again, we should have a square dance club. Mr. Shug published the first issue of the church newsletter, which was called the Lincoln Liberal. And that name was changed in October of 1950 
to the Lincoln Unitarian. The 50th anniversary of the church was celebrated in 1948. And in 1951, the name of the church was changed to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. In March 19, a lot happened. Yes, um, in March 1952, Mr. Shug accepted a call from the Unitarian Church of San Antonio, Texas. The period after Mr. Shug's departure until the end of the year was a rather difficult time for the church. The search committee was having problems finding a minister to succeed him. And finally, the committee, by a divided vote, agreed to issue a call to Reverend Isaiah Domus. So uh, Reverend Domus came to Lincoln with a very complex history. And um, I'll tell you more about him in my second fireside chat. But following uh, I.J. Domus, Isaiah Domus, oh, oh, that's the newspaper article that uh, introduced his family to the church. Um, I'll just leave that there for a second so you can read it. Uh, Peter Rabel was next, then Charles Stevens, who many of you remember. There he is right there. Then there were interims, uh, uh, intern minister Lisa Schwartz, and then Fred and Margie Kipe, Fred Campbell in 1997. And then Fritz Hudson came to his ministry in 1988 and stayed with us till 2013. Then there were int interims following. Um, Laura Shenham was actually a student minister while Fritz was still here. Uh, Justin Osterman and uh, Dr. Gretchen Woods were interims until we found our beloved Oscar Sinclair, who started his service, his ministry his service to our church in 2017. Um, I'm recording uh, this chat on November 8th. Um, it's actually November 18th. I don't know why I said November 8th, but it's November 18th. In 2017, after our church went through the search process, we called Oscar to be our settled minister. It was an intriguing process and one that I had never experienced in my growing up as a Roman Catholic. Oscar's legacy is being informed by our times. We are in a global pandemic and our church buildings are closed. So Oscar is recording our daily history in a virtual format archived on Facebook and YouTube. These are technologies beyond our ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for part two, which will include uh, some memories from our current members who are around in the 1950s. So thanks for listening, and I look forward to sharing more with you um, in a second chat. So take care, everybody.